We present Teddy Johnson as Steve Gardner in The Candle of Darkness, a serial thriller by Edward Boyd. The Candle of Darkness. Above all, let's play fair. Let's play fair above all. Honesty is the best policy, the man said, adding in a back of the dictionary burst of Latin, let justice be done though the heavens fall. Call me Steve Gardner and you'll get an answer. But there were things that happened long before I came along. And now, so we can start from scratch, let's happen them again. There was the poem. You who are alive, who survive, whom the mathematics of luck wakes ten-fingered to counter private dawn's blessing, what can you know of the clay and the candle of darkness and the worm's molecular kiss? And then there was that first midnight. Send it down, David, send it down. Yourself, is it? You turned the heart of me crossways jumping out of the dark like that. Would you listen to it grumbling and rumbling up there? If I had a son of mine on the sea this night, it's money I'd be spending on candles for a special intention. But I'd neither chick nor child, and as lucky they are the ones I haven't got. <laughs> what are you laughing at? What? Mother of heaven, what are you after doing? Get away from me with that knife you hear. Get away! Get away! Ah! That was the first one. Rose Anne McGurn. Charwoman, age 57, and prematurely. Sat at his child, worked hard for a living. Married, widowed, cheerful, childless, murdered. No relatives. No friends, no flowers by request. The second one died in a public park, named after a prosperous pawnbroker by a grateful community. But what was this punch up about? You. Huh, who won me? Luke Packerton, will you? Look, the fight was about me. I've a right to know. Who was defending my honour, if you'll pardon the expression? Now shut up. Charming. I've had you, big shot. Look, Stella. You were shouting the odds, weren't you, about me being your bird and worse. And Alex Anders told you to belt up and you tried to hit him and he knocked you down. Look, Then you tried to put the head on him and he knocked you down again. End of story. I'd had a drink. Great. That makes it all right then. You'd had a drink. Great. Don't worry. If I've had it, so has he. Oh, that'll be the day. I can hardly... Oh, what's wrong? I fell over something. I think it's a man... It's Alex Saunders. Was that why you brought me here? Was it? Did you bring me here to see him? Stella, You I, said I, he'd I, had it, didn't you? No, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Let me go. 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 Stella. Stella, come back. Stella, don't leave me here with this. Alex Saunders. Aged 18, apprentice engineer, waiting to join his parents in Toronto when his time was out. Which it was, now. Canadian papers, please copy. The third was a derelict called Jingling Geordie, who roamed about the district with the planet's predictability. Someone met him in a shop doorway, and now he would roam no more, for death is a notoriously fixed abode. Well, that's how the score stood that night when I got off the train in that little seaside town and spoke to the man who was sweeping confetti off the platform with a misogynistic broom. You want this? Eh? You want this? What is it? It's a railway ticket. Oh, <laughs> oh mate, the rail ticket. Thank you. Uh, where can I get a taxi? A taxi? Well, who runs the local garage? A Peter Cherry. Does he have a phone number? Yes. I'll bet you it's unlisted. Huh? Do you know his telephone number? Oh, yes. Care to share it? 
1389. Thank you. Where's the phone? Up there, past the gents. Well, there's planning for you. Thanks again. Eh, uh, the phone's out of order. Is the one in the office? Office is locked. You couldn't open it, perhaps. Oh, no. I'm looking for a bloke called Jimmy Morton. Town's filled with Mortons. It would be. Well, thanks for your help. I'll ask you in the town. Glad to have been of assistance. The town was built like an intelligence test. It was lit by weird green light. And that night, the lamplighter had had intermittent bouts of amnesia. Soon I was hopelessly lost. Then someone came billowing down on me like a black ship in full sail. She stumbled as she passed me and I caught her by the arm. <gasps> Steady on, old dear. Oh, Are you all right? Help! 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 The kind man! What? The kind man! The kind man? What are you talking about? He's going to kill me! I was only trying to help you, miss. He's trying to kill me! It was... I tell you! What are you talking about? Whatever is all this? The kind man! There he is, Mick! Grab hold of him! Watch it, this thing, boy! Take your hands off! Take your hands off! Hold on to him, Mick! All right. You ask for him, bud. Lynch him! Lynch him! Clear the way there! Clear the way there! Will you let me go? Lynch him! I'll take my back to you, Buggy Wilson. I'll break it up there now. Break it up. Now, I'm not going to tell you again. Right then. What's this all about? He's going to kill me. Was... I don't know what she's talking about. He's the guy, man. No, one at a time now, one oh, at a time. Oh, that's the way he kills them, one at a time. What the hell is all this kind man jazz? English. Yes, and it's high time you told these natives about the Union of the Crowns. Uh, start moving. Go on, move along. If your phones, oh. go to them. If you haven't, go to somebody else's. He's the kind man, I tell you. He's the kind man. We'll sort it all out when we get to the station. Now, will you move along when I tell you? Or I'll have to run you in. The police station was all polish and no spit. The sergeant there had the look of a fisherman who had got out of his bunk one morning and put on the wrong clothes and had just decided to stay with them. He looked at me as though I was bad visibility. The lady says you grabbed her. I stopped her falling on her face. Now I've seen her in the light, it wasn't worth the effort. She saw the gleam of metal. My wristwatch. Perhaps, perhaps. Look, would you care to search me? No, no, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Do me one small favour. We don't do favours. Break the rule just this once. Tell me, what is this all about? <clears throat> The lady goes on to say that The lady is out of a tiny bijou mind. Would you agree with that, Mackenzie? No, Sergeant. She's always seemed very normal to me, Miss Wiley. Miss Wiley? You know her. I know a million Miss Wileys. Elderly spinsters with fantasies of rape. What kind of way is that to talk? Be quiet, Mackenzie. But he said... I said quiet, Mackenzie. Sorry, Sergeant. How long have you been in this district, Mr... Uh, Gardner, Steve Gardner. And I've been in this nightmare town one whole long, meaningless hour. We can check, you know. Look the hell with this. What am I doing here? Assisting the police. You've just lost an assistant. You'd better find Inspector Gordon, Mackenzie. Inspector Gordon was a tall man with the lean, loping look of a deer hound. His face was the colour of insomnia, and there was a sadness about him, as though he'd seen it all and still didn't believe it. He sat and looked at me for a long, long time. Uh -huh. It won't work, Inspector. Uh, what won't work? The old silence treatment. Oh, is that what I was using? I've had it worked on me by professionals. Oh, I'm a professional myself. Not in the same class as the professionals I'm talking about. Oh, and who were they? Chinese, brainwashing experts. Oh, and when and where did you encounter them? In North Korea, when I was a teenager. Korea? I was a prisoner for two years. Did you collaborate? No. 
The sergeant tells me you're still not collaborating. I don't know what I'm supposed to collaborate about. You're from London, aren't you, Mr. Gardner? Is that a crime up here? No. <laughs> no not exactly, no. I understand you arrived on the last train. Mackenzie's checked, has he? He has indeed. What do you do for a living? I wheel and deal. Meaning? Somebody's got something you want, you've got something they want. I bring you together, you do a deal and I get a cut. You must know a lot of people. I do. Who do you know in this town? Jimmy Morton. You've come from London to... to wheel and deal with him. I hope so. Can you remember where you were on the 28th of November? Brussels. That came a bit pat, didn't it? I've only been in Brussels once. And only for one day. Uh, it's my business to remember details. Look, I have three people who will vouch for it. All right, all right. I believe you. Who is the kind man? Oh, homicidal maniac. Charming. He's killed three people. First, an old Irish woman. Then a boy of 18. And last, a middle-aged tramp. Each time, the knife. Each time, messy. I see no kindness there. We got to the tramp just before he died. He muttered something about a kind man. Ready-made for the press. Oh, they loved it. The kind man fits snug in their cloud cuckoo land where every killer is a prince of darkness and every dead drab is Cleopatra. Can I go now? There's a cosy newspaper theory about the kind man. There's a cosy newspaper theory about everything. It's based on the fact that the victims so far have all been alone. Mistress McGurn had no relatives. The tramp was alone in the world. And the boy's folks were in Canada, and he lived in digs. Alone. Mercy killing gone crazy. More or less. I'll stay indoors at full moon. In this town, Gardner, every night is full moon. The sergeant directed me to the Morton household and I set off through the frightened streets. Gordon was right. The town creaked with terror. It fluttered in a curtain's folds and the quick white look of a face. The air was dark and stifled as though it too had its head under the bedclothes. Ghosts of headlines whispered from orphan newspapers swirling in darkened alleys. The kind man. The kind man. The kind man. I took the road to the right, past the graveyard. An angel hung high above the wall in marble flight and holding out a laurel crown. He looked like he'd been caught making off with a doughnut. And then I heard footsteps, and my shoulder blades went taut. Mister. You want something? The price you bid, Mr. Atzo, just the price you bid. Friend. Have you no friends, friend? Eh? Oh, oh, I, oh, I have got friends. Hundreds. Then go to them, friend. Aye. I'll do that. I'll do that. Man, the kind man really does run this town. The Morton's house stood back in from the road. The gate was neither open nor shut, just stuck. You could have fought your way through the lawn in three days, with a compass and a good guide. Call me fanciful but the garden seemed only to grow black flowers. I walked up the path to the house. It had never been beautiful, never. And beautiful was the last thing it was now. I rang the bell. It tolled like the bell in that submerged cathedral. And suddenly, for a long time, nothing happened. What are you 
want it this time of night? Does Jimmy Morton live here? Who wants to know? I do. And who are you? I'm from the Bureau of Better Manners. And don't tell me you've already got some. Uh, who is it, Delia? Oh, it's some clever Englishman. I regard you highly, too. What does he want? He's looking for Jimmy. Oh, no. Oh, but, oh, yes. Show him into the drawing room. You do know who he is. Show him into the drawing room. Well, it's your funeral. Wipe your feet, you. The drawing room consisted mostly of books. They lay around like slates blown from a roof. Everything was filthy. And there were cobwebs on the cobwebs. The ashes in the fireplace were heaped and damp. The furniture was by Messrs. Wet Rot and Woodworm. All things considered, he wondered how Delia justified her existence. But the room had one striking feature, a portrait above the mantelpiece. A portrait of an astonishingly beautiful woman. Then the door opened, and there entered a faded little footnote of a man. My name is Wilfred Martin. I'm Jimmy's father. Uh, Gardner, Steve Gardner. Have we met before? No. No, I'm afraid uh, Jimmy's out at the moment. But he will be back. Oh, yes. Uh, that is, I suppose so. Uh, it's very important that I see him. Uh, oh? Do you mind if I wait? Uh, no. Uh, no. No. <coughs> Doesn't matter. If it's inconvenient, I'll go away and come uh, back again later. Uh, no, 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 no. You're perfectly welcome to wait. Uh, you're from London. That's right. You're not a, a, a policeman. Chance. Not by any chance. No. You must excuse that silly question. You see, Jimmy's such a complete enigma to me. It's a familiar pattern. Never know what he's thinking or what he's been doing. Never have known. You probably baffle him just as much. Yes? Yes. I suppose so. He doesn't owe you money, does he? Not a penny. I'm not doing very well, am I? Not very. You must make allowances for me. Consider them made. When you see practically no one for years and years, uh, social sense tends to become uh, fossilized. Uh, may I offer you a cup of coffee? I'd like that. Yes. Perhaps you'd be good enough to pull that bell rope beside you. Certainly. Oh! I'm, I'm sorry, it just seemed to come apart. Rotted. it. Whole house is rotten. I'll call Delia. 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 What is it now? Make some coffee, please. Make it yourself. I'm going to bed. Servant. No problem. I'll make the coffee if you like. That's that's very good of you. Uh, the kitchen. Uh, uh, yes, the, the, the kitchen. It's it, it at, the, at the end of the passage, on the left. I could have found that kitchen blindfold. It stank. As I went to switch the light on, something ruby-eyed glared at me and scuttled away. The light produced a flurry of disturbed beetles. There were about ten years' dishes sprawled in the sink. And not too far away... Two loaves were growing something that would probably cure penicillin. Heroically, I brewed the coffee and took it back to the drawing room. Mm. Excellent coffee. My one art form. <laughs> Do you mind if I ask you something? Not at all. It's about that portrait over the mantelpiece. Yes. That's a lovely thing. It's a portrait of my wife. A very beautiful woman. She died giving birth to Jimmy. I'm glad you didn't say I'm sorry or something meaningless like that. Most people do. I never know what to say, so I say nothing. A life for a life, some fool said. Well, I didn't think much of that sort of bargain. I still don't. Your coffee's getting cold. The top of the house was peculiarly hers. After she died, I locked it up. I left it exactly as it was, like that ever since. Cleaned it myself. 
The piano is always kept tuned. For heaven's sake, why? This is a house of ghosts. That's her ghost. Always. And I'm a ghost. Jimmy's become one too. The only real person in the house has been Delia. I reckon. When I brought her here from the orphanage, she was uh, stupid and clumsy, but she was real. She still is. No. Something's happened to her. And she isn't real anymore either. What this house needs is all its windows broken, preferably with Delia's head. Uh, oh, 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 you're a... You're a very frank person. Not always. I can be as devious as the next one. Yeah, I hope you haven't come here to be devious. I don't have to be. I'm glad to hear it. Mind you, it's a devious little town you've got here. I was asked tonight where I was on the 28th of November. An odd question. And why would anyone ask it? Why, indeed. Could that be the date when your local maniac killed his last victim? Uh, Mr. Morton. Uh, Mr. Morton, are you all right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I'm all right. Uh, uh, I think that's Jimmy now. I'll, I'll leave you together. Jimmy. Yes, Father. You have a visitor. A visitor? In the drawing room. Thank you. Good night, Jimmy. Good night, Father. He had hardly changed. The famous charm was still undimmed, and his face still kept that incredible youthfulness, but with a difference. There's something like a grey dust over both face and charm, as though neither had been used for a long time. Steve Gartner! Hello, Jimmy! Great to see you! <laughs> Hey, what's hey. happened to your face? Fair wear and tear. Your father never even noticed it. I never notices anything. Where have you sprung from? London. And how is London these days? Swinging, or so I keep reading. Great. Great to <laughs> see you. Bongo Warren sends his love. No, you're still in touch? Occasionally. What's he doing? Public relations. What else? <laughs> <laughs> Does he still have that fantastic moustache? He has, and he's still talking about Korea. Oh, yeah. Korea. How did Bongo know you'd be seeing me? I told him I was coming here. Ah, uh, uh. That's right, Jimmy. I'm an ambassador. They want you back. It's not on. Why not? I haven't got it anymore. Oh, come on, Jimmy. You don't just lose talent through a hole in your pocket. You don't understand. It's a big deal, Jimmy. No, but I couldn't. At least let's talk about it. All right, Steve. We'll talk about it. But not now. Not tonight. In the morning, maybe. As long as we talk. You must stay with us tonight. Um, well, I was thinking of... No, no, I won't hear of anything else. You can have my room. I'll, I'll sleep in the spare one. I insist. I absolutely insist. All right. All right, Jimmy, whatever you say. We talked for a while about this and that and everything except the thing I'd come to talk about. And finally, we said goodnight and sought our virtuous couches. I woke up with my spine crawling. I could hear a voice, and it was right in my ear. Hello, Jimmy. I'm here again, Jimmy. Have you missed me, Jimmy? I've got another one for you tonight. Listen. You who are alive, who survive, whom the mathematics of luck wakes ten-fingered to counter private dawn's blessing. What can you know of the clay and the candle of darkness and the worm's molecular kiss? I haven't finished it, Jimmy. I'm still working on it. But don't worry. As soon as it's finished, I'll be back again. I'll be back. What is this? What the hell is going on here? Steve! Is this your idea of a joke, Jimmy? You've had it, Steve. See, you've had it. I heard it, all right. You're not just saying that, Steve. You wouldn't do that, would you? Pull yourself together. I'm glad you had it. I'm Jimmy. glad you had it. Jimmy, listen to me. Just a minute. Who's that outside there? Who is it? It's me. 
Delia. What are you doing wandering around? None of your business. I don't dig you, and I don't dig your turn, and if it doesn't improve, I'm liable to tear it right out by the roots. Uh, I came down because I thought I heard a noise. Well, you didn't, so beat it. Yes, sir. All right, Jimmy, now, what about this voice? It was him again. Who? Francis. Francis Lennox. You mean you recognised the voice? Yes. Then why don't you go and punch him in the mouth? Because Francis Lennox has been dead for years. <laughs> I swear to you, or my name isn't Steve Gardner, there's nothing so quiet as a little seaside town in winter. When you have a homicidal maniac loose, when you're almost lynched just for being out after dark, and the man you've come up from London to see is behaving very strangely, and the police are hostile, when you wake up at night in a crumbling household with a voice repeating a poem in your ear. All right, Jimmy, what about this voice? It was him again. Who? Francis. Francis Lennox. You mean you recognise the voice? Yes. Then why don't you go and punch him in the mouth? Because Francis Lennox has been dead for years. <laughs> Sit down, Jimmy. How long has this been going on? The voice? That'll do to start with. Four years. Every night? I wish it was. Why do you say that? If it was every night, I could get used to it. It's not knowing when. That's the killer. You couldn't be mistaken. I mean, one whisk was pretty well like another. Francis Lennox and I were born within two years of each other. We lived practically next door. We went to the same school. One time we had the same kind of crush on the same girl. We were in Korea together. We were in the same prison camp. Anything happened there? Nothing. It was just a prison camp. You're certain he's dead? If he wasn't, we buried him alive. You've got to get out of here, Jimmy. I can't. You must. Must? You'll go spare if you don't. Oh, don't con me, Steve. You're not really worried about me. You've been told to bring me back, and you'll use any means on hand to do that. You're at it. All right, all right, so I have an axe to grind. What of it? It's a pretty clean axe. It's going to hurt nobody. It's going to take you out of this this Dracula's den and put you where the lights are brighter. It's going to fill your pockets with lovely, melodious money. It's going to give a lot of people a lot of work and others a lot of fun. Shut up, Steve. Look, the book's written. It's only great. The music and lyrics are Rogers and Hammerstein class. There's the cast that could film the theatre if the roof was taken up and the seats turned backwards. And there's a part that's tailored just for you. No! The public made you, Jimmy. Don't you feel any responsibility to them? I have a bigger responsibility here. Your father? Yes. But he's a big boy now. He can probably tie his own shoelaces. I can't leave him alone. Are you afraid the kind man will get him? I'm afraid of a lot of things, but the last thing I'm afraid of is that the kind man will get my father. Do you know what you're saying? Oh, don't come on at me, Steve. Why do you have to come here anyway? Why couldn't you leave me alone? I was making it, getting used to it, and then you... Oh, sure, I want to come back. I never wanted to be away. Do you think it's easy when you've been up there just to jack it all in and walk on by? Well, I'm here to tell you... What are you here to tell me? The London bit is out. You yourself, Steve. You're welcome to stay as long as you like, but no more London talk, OK? It's not... But I'll accept it. Fine. And now I'm going back to bed. It's been quite a night. Quite a night. The great thing about daylight is that it at least seems to make sense. It makes sinister houses seem merely shabby chases away bats and owls and things with gleaming eyes. It creates colours all over again. It has a quality of antisepsis. I was lying in bed savouring the daylight when suddenly my door burst open and a huge bearded man erupted into the room. Out of it, Jimmy. Out, I say. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't know there was company at the manor. I arrived too late to make the gossip column. I might have frightened the life out of you bursting in like that. Well, you didn't. Why don't you sit down? In this house? Never. I may on occasion breeze through it like a wholesome wind, but sit down in it? Never. Though the place has a wonderful accumulated medieval filth. 
You have the name, no doubt? Gardner. Steve Gardner. Should I know it? I mean, are you some sort of celebrity? I decided not to be. So that I'll have less to lose when they drop the bomb. <laughs> I grow to love you, sir. <laughs> it happens everywhere I go. Come, Gardner. Hurl yourself from that dingy, grey-sheeted, odoriferous, graveyard-blanketed, brick-pillowed insult to the name of hospitality, and we will take the air together. If I meet anyone in the long, dark passage to the bathroom, who do I say drag me out of bed? Say that Romilly Foster is here. I've heard of you. Anyone who can read has. Ah, here comes our jolly host. A very good morning to you, Wilfred Morton. Good morning. You have all the bright, early quality of chewed grey wool. I hope you are comfortable, Mr. Gardner. Fine, thank you. I'm afraid I didn't sleep at all well. I seldom do. You always do. You sleep your dormouse way through. Rip Van Winkling from generation to generation in a shabby dream of nothingness. Why do you come to this house if you despise us all so much? I come bouncing in and out of this house in a disinfectant capacity. You flatter yourself. And in the vague but imperishable hope that your son might even yet be brought back from this living tomb. Neither my son nor I are interested in your undergraduate therapy. A fig for you and your preferences. One day, Foster... You will drive me to kill you. <laughs> Come, Gardner. Hurry, man, hurry. The bird of time is on the wing. Soon the tavern doors will be opening, and the mingled scent of malt and new sawdust will be dizzying the Presbyterian air. <laughs> Inside the pub, it was cool and clean, and at that time in the morning, we had the place all to ourselves. Good luck to you, and all who sail in you. Cheers. Ah, I love beer. I loathe whiskey. Whiskey always gives me the delusion that I am Attila the Hun. I shouldn't think you need either. I imagine you can get drunk on words. My daily consumption of beer is in the neighbourhood of three gallons. You're built for it. <laughs> what I can't understand is this. Why does a famous character like you bury himself in a place like this? Gardner, let us here and now abandon modesty to the old maids and the secretly modest. I am the biggest literary gun in the country. Therefore, I can shell at long range. I can sit here and pick off all the scribbling little mannequins and minikins, poetasers and versifiers that scurry beneath the smoke of the metropolis. Is that the only reason? Uh, frankly, no. I wanted to write a study of a poet called Francis Lennox. How about that? You know his work? I've, uh, I've heard some of it. I came here originally to gather material for my Lennox study. I have stayed five fascinated years trying to understand how such a magnificent blossom of poetry could have been nourished in this little dung heap of a Scottish village. <clears throat> Two more pints, you am. Right away, Mr. Foster. How good was Lennox, do you reckon? The greatest in this century. Can I get him in paperback? Oh, yes, with a preface by Romilly Foster. Too much too soon. <laughs> Two pints, sir. Uh, this is mine. I was the first to publish him, you know. I was running my magazine, Nose and Thumb, at the time. Lennox sent me some poems. Astonishing stuff from a boy of 16. Perfect. I wrote him an excited letter about them. He sent me some more. They were even better. Did you ever meet him? Oh, yes. Two or three times in London. What was he like? He was the handsomest man I ever saw. Tall, golden and masculine. None of this scruffy, what's-the-point-of-it-all-I-opt-out kind of rubbish. He was a man. He was honest. He had all the integrity in the world. And the North Koreans murdered him in a prison camp? No. But I understand. He was murdered in the prison camp, all right. But not, I have reason to believe, by the North Koreans. I came out of the pub in a daze that had nothing at all to do with Huey McInnes's prime beer. It was, if you like, a triangular daze, composed of three voices. First, there was Jimmy. We went to the same school. We were in Korea together. We were in the same prison camp. Then there was Jimmy's father. I am a ghost. Jimmy has become one too. And finally, there was the whispering voice that had spoken in my ear. The voice that Jimmy said was the voice of Francis Lennox. You who are alive, 
who survive, whom the mathematics of luck wakes ten-fingered to counter private dawn's blessing. What can you know of the clay and the candle of darkness and the worm's molecular kiss? Three voices, two home and one away, far away, out of this world, literally. I didn't like the thoughts my brain was thinking, so I took them for a walk through the little town. In the center of the town, there was an odd little oasis, a patch of grass with benches grouped round the local war memorial. Inspector Gordon was seated on one of the benches, reading the names of the dead in World War I. The dead of World War II were noticed underneath, like a postscript to a letter. A morbid way to spend a lovely morning. Ah, Mr. Gardner. And how is the, the wheeling and dealing? At a standstill. Oh, well, but I'm told that times are hard all over. They're particularly hard down here. Your friend Morton, I take it, is not being cooperative. You could say that. I have a problem. Only one? It's a big one. There are all kinds of problems now. Uh, financial, uh, marriage. This is a moral problem. Oh, if you feel you must weep on a shoulder, then I willingly offer you mine. But mind, as a private individual, not as a policeman. Suppose it concerned you as a policeman. Ah, then you would have both my private and my official ear. <laughs> Has the prospect frightened you away? Can I tell this in my own way? Oh, please do. All right, here we go. I told you I was a wheeler and dealer. You mentioned it. When I came up here to persuade Jimmy Morton to come back to London, he turned me down flat. Or maybe he's permanently tired of the rat race. There's nothing wrong with a rat race. Only the quality of the rats. Uh, but, but, but I interrupted you. You didn't, really. You see, Jimmy enjoyed the rat race, and he wants to go back. So there must be a pretty hefty reason that keeps him here. Logical. Now, supposing I'd found out what that reason is. Which you have done? Which I have done. Let's suppose some more. No, I... Let's forget it. If you removed that reason, then young Morton will go back to London and you would have achieved what you came up here for, right? Brilliant. This is where the problem becomes a moral one, isn't it? Yes. What exactly is involved? Betraying Jimmy, breaking a confidence. And bringing the police into the business? Yes. People like you, Gardner, have a sort of fifth form morality. People like me have no morality at all. We just have friends. As I see it, you have no problem at all. What you do have is a duty as a responsible citizen. I've heard all this before. It'll be a repetition. I'll think about it. Think about this as well. At the least, you may be obstructing justice. At the worst, you may be making yourself an accessory to something very, very, very unpleasant. I'll think about all that too. I left him to resume his contemplation of the memorial's dead names. I could smell the smell of a boat beginning to burn, and it was one of my own. The afternoon was settling in now. Cats in shop doorways soaked up the sun like black blotting paper. A coal merchant was doing his rounds, and every so often a weird, dark howl would come from his face. Tiny children were bouncing home from school, smelling of free milk. Plasticine. Then I saw a sign that said County Library. There, I thought, is the place to start the search for Francis Lennox. The girl at the library counter was fair eyed and bespectacled, but her teeth were good. Can I help you, sir? I'm sure you can. I'm looking for a book. Then you've come to the right place. <laughs> I wish I'd said that. <laughs> Did you have any particular book in mind? Any book of poems by Francis Lennox. Oh, yes, our local genius. We're all very proud of him here. His early death was a great loss to literature. An irreparable loss. We only have one book of his. That's to say, if it isn't out on loan at the moment, The Forgery of the Spirit. Could you check if you have it, please? Oh, of course. If it's there, I'll fetch it for you. You're very kind. Not at all. Won't be a moment. <laughs> Luxor, here it is. Ah, oh, good. Um. Yes. Do you uh, have a library ticket? A library ticket? I'm afraid I can't let you have the book out without one. I only want it for a very short time. Oh, I'm sorry. 
My television producers are going to go spare about this. Television? My own fault, of course. I should have bought a copy of the poems up from London with me. Are you going to do a television programme about Francis Lennox? Yes, I'm up here doing a recce. Filming? That's right. Well, here? In the library? Why not? We could. And that's what you need the book for? Yes. If anything happens... I'll say I walked out with it absentmindedly. All right. You're a doll. Anything for our local genius. You like his poems? Well, actually, um, <laughs> I've never read any of them. I took my unofficial crown octavo, library-bound prophet without honor, out with me into the sunshine. The pavements were hot and the houses baked beneath the high mackerel sky. It was going to be a good day tomorrow, except for those who wouldn't ever see tomorrow. Well, that cheerful reflection took me to the police station and the ironic Inspector Gordon. Have you decided to tell me, or will you be burned at the stake? I've decided to tell you. Tell me, then. Now, last night when I left here, I went to the Morton house and walked into a real gothic set, a mouldering old house, mouldering old man. Mouldering young man, too, they tell me. Yes, and the weirdest maid you ever saw. Her name is Delia Dewar. Uh, what's weird about her? She runs the house. Of course she does. I don't mean in that way. Then what way do you mean? Well, she cracks the whip and her masters jump through hoops. Oh, go on. Well, like I told you, I came here to excavate Jimmy Morton. So I put the proposition to him. He threw it out, got quite neurotic about it. So? So we decided to sleep on it. Oh, you stayed in the house? Jimmy insisted. He said I could have his room and he'd sleep in the spare. We talked for a while and then we broke it up. I went to bed and woke up in the middle of the night. Someone was whispering right in my ear. Delia, perhaps? It was a man's voice, whispering a poem, something about a candle of darkness. A candle of darkness? Yes. Oh, I like that. And what happened then? Well, the next thing, Jimmy was bursting into the room. He was near hysterical. I calmed him down, then he told me he'd been hearing this voice for four years. Did he recognize the voice? He said it was the voice of a dead man. I tried to use the situation to make Jimmy change his mind about London. I suggested the reason he stayed here was his father. I asked him, sarcastic-like, if he was afraid the kind man would grab his father. Oh, and what did he say to that? He said that that was the last thing he was afraid of. Interesting. Very interesting. I thought it was, too. The inference being that his father was the kind man. You make your inferences and I'll make mine. It's a strange story. Is that the official way of calling me a liar? Oh, the official way is to check everything that can be checked. Uh, ghostly voices hardly fall into that category. But the other thing does. The other thing does. Well, where do we go from here? Well, now, you being in the house... No! You... Uh, I was only going to suggest I've that... said my piece once and for all. From now on, you're on your own. You are a character, Gardner. You don't shirk the big betrayal, but you funk all the little ones that are part and parcel of it. Look, there are the things I want to do and the things I have to do. I get just as confused between them as the next man. You're just evading responsibility. Maybe. If so, I'm evading it all the way. I'm not going to spy for you. From now on, you're on your own. I left the police station and went down to the sea wall and read some Francis Lennox. I have never been asked to adjudicate the Nobel Prizes for poetry, which is just as well for Francis Lennox. What his poetry did for me was precisely nothing. So I looked at the harbour. Two motorboats preened themselves in the still water, and on the harbour wall, an old man in a blue seaman's jersey was talking to a girl. The old man had a look of cape stiff and shipping them green on the starboard quarter and Barks, jury rigged, limping into port with himself tied to the wheel. Actually, he was only local colour for the tourists, photogenic and phony. But the girl was something special. She was a good deed in a naughty world. And watching her, I forgot Francis Lennox. He was only a dead genius and she was a live masterpiece. Then I got up to walk home, and I hadn't gone far before. You left your book lying on the sea wall. Thank you. You've got lousy taste in literature. You reckon? I reckon. A critic already. So you're from London. 
big deal. The news certainly does get around fast here, doesn't it? We get a new face. We don't see many of them. Well, you don't look local. I am? I didn't say you weren't. I just said you didn't look it. We're international nowadays, the young. Didn't anybody tell you? <laughs> What's your name? Marshall. Lindy Marshall. Gardner. Steve Gardner. Hello. Tell me about yourself, Lindy. Then what? You'll make me a big star or something? Oh, who's been kicking you around, doll? Nobody kicks me around. Is that what you want to be, a big star? I want to be a writer. You must be mad. <laughs> I know. These Francis Lennox poems, what's wrong with them? Well, they're not about anything or anybody. These poems are acting all the time, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yes. You're absolutely right. You don't dig them either. <laughs> I think they're a load of old rubbish. A critic already. <laughs> <laughs> Romilly Foster doesn't agree with us. Mm. You know Romilly Foster? Yeah. Oh, well, that takes care of him then. He's a balloon. All that phony Dylan Thomas bit. Young lady, to be a writer is the privilege of privileges. And if the weight of my undoubted influence can push you one small inch towards Parnassus, let my shoulder be your guest. Then? Then he made a big swinging pass at me, so I clobbered him. <laughs> Come on, I'll buy you a coffee. We went to a dingy cafe run by a sad, limping little Italian who looked as though he had just received a Get Well Soon card from the Mafia. And it turned out to be more than just coffee. The girl ate enough spaghetti to stuff a mattress. She ate like they were banning food tomorrow. And when she finished, she looked at me across the checkered tablecloth. I'm a pig. When did you last eat? Who's counting? I'll mind my own business. Cigarette? Mm -mm, I don't. What's your interest in Francis Lennox? I'm not sure yet. I mean, you don't look the literary type, you know. I'm not. I talk too much, especially on a full stomach. It's to hide it rumbling. <laughs> you know Jimmy Morton? Oh, I know everybody in this town. You like it? Hmm. Yes, I suppose so. He's very talented, but... But? I mean, he's sort of gone soft at the centre, if you see what I mean. Yes, but I'm trying to get him to come back to London. Huh? Good luck. Yeah, I don't know. There's a funny situation going on, and this Francis Lennox thing is part of it. I don't know. Francis Lennox once worked for my father. Really? Mm. Do you think I could speak to your father? He's dead. Oh, Lindy, I'm sorry. Alcohol poisoning. I'm telling you because you'll hear it anyway, this being a small town and everything. He was a building contractor. First he drank himself out of business, and then he drank himself to death. End of story. Did you like him? Yes. He was a good, weak man who just couldn't cope. And your mother? She ran off with some man to Canada. Somewhere romantic like that. Mr. Blamer. How old are you? Eighteen. And what do you do? Nothing special. Anything honest. I mean at the moment. I'm unemployed. And there's a lot of it about. You live alone? Sir? <laughs> yes, I live alone. A dreary bed sitter with a gas ring. How about friends? None. The kids here bore me. <laughs> I mean, the, the things I'm interested in... That Oh, I don't know how to say it without sounding like some... Anyway, the kids here bore me. So you live alone and have no friends. I don't like that. Why not? Oh, oh come on. You're, you're not going on about that kind man jazz. That's exactly what I am on about. That's a load of old newspaper rubbish. Goose pimples for the mums and dads. No, I'm not so sure. You worry about everybody like this? Only people I dig. You'll get premature grey hair. Well, I've got to go now. Things to do, you know. I'd like to keep in touch. I drink a, a lot of coffee here, and if I'm not here, Marco takes phone messages for me. I'll remember. Thanks for the meal and everything. Ciao. Ciao. Oh, um, don't sit up nights worrying about me. I can take care of myself. 
Tchau. She went off and suddenly there was a hole in the day. So I called for the bell and paid it. And the sad, limping little Italian took the money and gave me change. And all the time he was worrying about that get well soon card from the mafia. I went back to the shaggy, broken-nailed, draggle-tailed, non-mod, con horror of a house where the Mortons existed. It was filled with quiet smells, like a family vault. Even to open the door made me feel like Burke and Hare. I stole quietly along to my room. There was already somebody in there, bent in a devotional attitude over my open travelling bag. A praying mantis, enthusiastically praying its way through my belongings. I watched for a moment from the doorway, and then I spoke. And just what did you hope to find in there, Delia? Delia knelt there, watching me. Her red, repulsive face was slick with sweat. Even across the room, you could tell what her favorite deodorant was. None. And whatever made her face red, it was certainly not shame. Never heard you coming in. That's a risk thieves have to take. Are you calling me a thief? Only till I can think of something worse. What were you after? Or were you just window shopping? I was just putting your things away. That I can well believe. Mr. Morton told me to. Jimmy did? Yes. No. His father? Both of them. They both told me. You're a liar, Delia. All right, ask them. I'll do just that. See if they dare deny it. Dare? That's what I said. I know. And I find it very interesting. Get out! You can't talk to me like Get out, you sleazy, insolent, dim-witted layabout, you... Don't you touch me! Touch you? Get out! You'll be sorry for this. What's all this? <sighs> this fancy Englishman thinks he's taking over. All right, Delia, that's enough. Oh, is it? That's what you think. Be quiet, Delia. What's the trouble, Steve? I caught her going through my baggage. Delia! And she seems confident that nothing will be done about it. You told me to, didn't you, Jimmy? Well, Jimmy? I've heard of democracy, but this is ridiculous. Well, I... I told her to lay out your things, and, and if anything needed washing... Do me a favour. What is this, a stately home? Throw them out, Jimmy. Go and throw them out. It's your house. Well, Jimmy? It's your house, Jimmy. No, Delia. It's your house. Oh, I'm sorry about this, Mr Gardner. It's only a slight misunderstanding, Father. Uh, it's easily settled. Oh? And how do you propose to settle it, Jimmy? Well, I... Do we ask your friend and our guest to apologise to Delia for catching her red-handed? Look, Mr Morton, I'll clear out. I'm sorry I've caused this trouble. Oh, the trouble was here long before you came, Gardner. Father... I, I tried to ignore it. I tried to buy it off. I tried everything except facing it. But now... Now what? You have 15 minutes to get out of this house, Delia. Yeah, joking. Fifteen minutes. You must be mad. On the contrary, I'm having my first lucid interval for years. Father, let's not be hasty. Another thing, Delia. These pearls you're wearing, they belong to my wife. You have absolutely no right to have them in your possession, and even less right to wear them. You'll get them back out. Get them back oh, here. You've broken the string. Oh, break more than the string. I'll stop them. You Morton, for heaven's oh, sake! Father, you'll kill her! Let her go, Morton! Father, I... let her go! <laughs> it tried to strangle me. Take her away! Take her away! It tried to. Get out, you fool, while you can! I'm sorry about all this, Gardner. The first rule of hospitality is skeletons should be kept firmly in their cupboards. Well, when you've got a skeleton as robust as Delia. Quite. I suppose you must start thinking about getting another girl. Perhaps I could be of some assistance there. You know of someone? I think so. No, I don't care what she is, as long as she's honest. This one is honest to a fault. Well... 
There are plenty of faults here for her to be honest, too. Of course, there's no guarantee she'll be interested. Yeah, I should be obliged if you would ask her anyway. I'll ask her. This girl of yours. Correction, this girl I spoke about. Are you sure? You're asking, is she part of some deep, dark plot I'm hatching? Well, is she? Oh, for heaven's sake, Jimmy, you're becoming paranoiac. You're a, a pretty tricky boy, Steve. Yeah, yeah, I'm tricky. I'm the trickiest. I set up Delia to go through my baggage. I set it up for you to come along just when I'm bawling her out. And then I fix it... I fix it for your father to appear and fire her. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, I've got this other bird lined up to take over from Delia and be my spy. Or whatever the hell you think she is. Look, Jimmy, this is a local bird. I only met her this morning. What's her name? Lindy Marshall. And if you say the word, she'll never even know there was a situation vacant here. You don't want anyone else in the house, do you? There could be reasons for that. That's your problem. Mine is this girl. What's it to be, Jimmy? Yes or no? My father's head of this house. I only haunt it. Oh, come on, Jimmy. Where do I find a telephone? There's a booth just round the corner to the left. Thank you. Petty larceny, attempted strangulation, recrimination, self-pity, delusions of reference. When you're wheeling and dealing, sometimes you earn your money hard. I found the telephone booth and dialed the little cafe. Marco agreed gloomily that yes, he was Marco, and yes, as it happened, she was there and he would call her to the phone. Uh, hello? Lindy? Yes. Uh, who, who is this? Steve Gardner. We met this morning. Uh, yes, yes, I remember. I found your job. What kind of a job? Housekeeper. You're joking, of course. No. And uh, who do I keep house for? You? <laughs> you don't trust me one tiny bit, do you? Well, you're a big London boy and I'm only a simple country girl. Now tell me who I keep house for. The Mortons. They've already got a housekeeper, Delia Dewar. She's just been bombed out. <laughs> Fancy the job? Uh, talk me into it. Well, to begin with, they need you more than you need them. Big deal. No kidding. It's time there was some light and colour in that mausoleum. You're a con man. They'll probably pay more than the labour exchange. It's better. It'll keep you off the street corners. I'll miss them. Come on, Lindy, what do you say? Why not? Great. You know where the house is? Oh, come off it. Right, come straight over now. I got back in the house in time to catch Delia's farewell performance. She came downstairs slowly in time to inaudible music. She was dressed in what the well-dressed woman would never wear any year. The whole thing seemed a grotesque burlesque of a musical comedy finale. What are you all staring at? There should have been a roll on the drums. You're a wise guy, aren't you, Mr. Fleming Gardner? You know all the answers. Pride yourself on knowing them. But maybe you don't know all the questions. Maybe there's a few you should ask your friends, the Mortons. Look, do we have to go ask through? Ask them what happened to that souvenir dagger Jimmy brought home from Korea. Ask them who took it off the wall and where it is now. Ask them what took them both out at night when decent people should have been in bed. Ask them about the night Jimmy came in with blood in his hands. Ask them what they know about the kind man. You've done your bit now, Delia. I think you'd better go. Oh, I'm going. Don't worry. But don't think you're throwing me out. I'm walking out of here on my own free will. And I'm going to better things. Delia! What do you want? I want to congratulate you on moving on to better things. And to warn you. Warn me? Against shouting from the housetops. That's the truth. Perhaps, as you see it. I don't understand that. Then perhaps you will understand this. You are an orphan, Delia. I know that better than most people. I took you from the orphanage in a moment of sentimentality which I've often since regretted. Also, Delia, you are friendless. A 
don't think I've ever met anyone who was more friendless. Why, you see it. This, if the newspapers are to be believed, our unknown maniac has a very definite predilection for the orphaned and the friendless. He considers himself to have a mission. He sees the killing of such people as an act of grace and mercy. He is... He is cruel only to be kind. You threaten me. No, Delia, I'm simply pointing out that you are perfect material for the kind man. And if I were you, once I had left the protection of this house, I would make myself very, very inconspicuous. Yes, Mr. Martin. Yes, I promise you. Oh, let me out. Please, please, let me out. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't find that funny. No. No, I suppose not. It wouldn't have seemed funny to me either a short time ago. But I was blind then. I still am to a certain extent. I would... No, what? I think I know who this is. Who? Delia's successor. Hello, Lindy. Hello. Come on in. Mr. Morton's in here. This is uh, Lindy Marshall. I understand you want to come and work here. No. But I thought... Steve said there was a job, so I thought there's no harm in looking. OK, so I'm looking. That's all. Don't do us any favours, please. I won't. This, this place pongs. <laughs> you know, I think I'm going to enjoy having you around here. You mean she's actually coming here? If she decides she wants to. But that's ridiculous. Oh, the house is equally ridiculous. If you don't like the idea, Jimmy, you could always move out. Say, uh, back to London. The hell with you, Steve. Charming. You may do as you please with the house, my dear. All of it? Not quite. The top part, I keep locked up. I heard about that. Uh, no doubt what you had was greatly exaggerated. And no doubt you thought it was extremely romantic. I thought it was daft. Yeah? She always sparks like that when anyone tries to pat her on the head. Sorry, I, c I can't help it. It's like standing on a cat, sort of. Uh, I see... Well, as I was saying, I do not wish the top rooms to start. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. Oh. Well, it, it looks like I'm lumbered. You can still cut and run. Oh, no. Who does that Jimmy think he is? Hamlet? He'll come round. And this Bluebeard's chamber I bit. shouldn't worry too much about that, either. We never got round to talking about money, did we? I think you'll find the old man fairly generous. Well, if I do as well as Delia, you won't find me complaining. You reckon she did well? I met her coming along the road and she was carrying a handbag of worth about 40 guineas. Well, now, isn't that interesting? I left her there and went out into the town. The darkness was gathering septically moving through the streets like poison through veins. Cats sleeked through the boneless dark, seeking familiars. Vampire bats hung folded in each suspicious eyelid. The streets were paved with tombstones, and every tree was a gallows tree. I feel rather that way myself. What? The... Inspector Gordon, I presume. You almost frightened me out of my wits. <laughs> Quite an achievement. This rotten town's getting under my skin. Well, then why do you stay? I have a soul to save. Highly commendable. I have a feeling tonight that I could well do without. It's his kind of night, isn't it? Inside information? Look here, Gordon. Easy now, easy. You're chumpy. The whole town is. Well, they're worried. They're worried because the kind man has not been kind for too long. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, oh, yes, what can we do for you, madam? I, I didn't mean to stay out so late, but I, I got chatting, and you know how the time slips by. Oh, I do indeed. Before I knew, it was dusk, and then it was pitch black, and here I'm caught out in it. 
and my friend lives by herself and short of convoying each other back and forwards all night. We didn't rightly know what to do. Uh, and then my friend <laughs> looked out of the window and saw that there were two of you and she said to me, Belle, there's your chance. Safety in numbers, eh? Uh, it's a wrong kind of a night. So uh, you would like one of us to escort you home, eh? Not one of you. Both of you. Oh, well, that, madam, I regret is impossible. Oh, well, then I'll just go back to my friends. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, my name is Gordon. I'm Inspector Gordon, and I'm in charge of the investigations into the... Don't mar- say it. Very well, I won't. But what I will say is that this gentleman here is a Mr. Gardner from London, and he has only been in this town for about 48 hours. Oh. I see. I see. Now, madam, the way I feel at this moment, I wouldn't be at all surprised if I turned out to be the kind man. But one thing I do know, Mr. Gardner is perhaps a solitary person in this town who most definitely is not. I beg your pardon. Both of you. Oh, we understand. (laughs) Gardner, would you escort this lady to her home? With the greatest pleasure. You're very kind. Not at all. Shall we go? Please. Good night. We set off through the cloaked streets, walking slowly. She clung to my arm, weighing no more than a thread on my sleeve. She didn't speak. Perhaps she was still not sure of me. Perhaps she was still thinking that the night was somehow wrong. The night was wrong. The town was a black desert, starred with desperate lights. A forlorn, unbought smell drifted from the fried fish shop. The salt air was clammy. The sea was silent. Finally, we reached the old lady's house. There we are. You'll come in for a minute. Well, that's kind of you. The fire's blazing fine. A fire's company, don't you think? Definitely. (laughs) Sit you down. Sit you down. Thank you. You've something to do with television, I hear. Uh, Television? Uh, My granddaughter was telling me. Um, well... Uh, She works in the county library. Oh, oh yes, yes, of course. Oh, she was very helpful. (laughs) She said you were... What was her word name? Sexy, that's what it was. <laughs> she certainly needs those glasses. Oh, not Harrison. I can appreciate a description. I mean to say, I'm only 77. Impossible. No, 77 it is. I heard you were asking about Francis Lennox. Yes, uh, yes I was. I taught him at school. You were a teacher? I was, over 40 years. And I taught Francis Lennox. And his father before him. Tell me about Lennox. He was the handsomest boy you ever saw. He was brilliant and as brave as a lion. Teacher's pet? I detested the sight of him. Oh! (laughs) For a minute there, you had me fooled. Uh I haven't learned much from life. But one thing I have learned, never trust perfection. And what was perfect about Lennox? His selfishness. It was so perfect, it had a kind of terrifying beauty. He would lie, cheat, flatter, whine, bully, scream to get whatever he wanted. And when he got it, like as not, he'd break it and throw it away. What else? There was always something odd about Francis. He wasn't a Lennox at all. I knew his grandfather and his father, the whole family. But Francis was different in every way. Heredity sometimes does that. Oh, it does, it does. When you're a teacher as long as I was, you develop a kind of instinct about families, and I always felt that Francis was never a Lennox. That's his picture over there. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. It was taken the year he won the Butte Scholarship. Oh, that's odd. What is? I could swear I'd seen him somewhere before. If you'd ever met Francis Lennox, you'd be in no doubt. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> it's getting near my bedtime. Yes, and I'll be on my way. 
Now, I didn't offer you tea because tea I do not consider a man's drink. <laughs> and secondly, because I wanted to ask you another small favour. You name it. Do you know Huey McInnes's pub? I was in there this morning. Well, in you go again and tell Huey that his auntie's safe home and it was you convoyed her and it is to give you a, a dram for your trouble. <laughs> There were only three men in the bar. Romilly Foster, crimson and huge like an alcoholic sunset. On one side of him, a little man, erect only by a special dispensation of gravity. On the other, a dark, sullen man, a neat gypsy. You knew as soon as you saw him, he was an old soldier. The scrounging type that's good to have beside you in a war. The scrounging type that's untranslatable in terms of a world at peace. Romilly Foster caught sight of me as I opened the door. Gardener! My ironical friend, come to me arms. Man, you're certainly feeling no pain. You drop into the desert of my life with the grateful munificence of manner. I dropped in to collect a freight charge of one dram for bringing Huey McInnes's aunt home. Huey! A dram! And a tankard of celebration for me. Right away, Miss Foster. Gardener, all night I have been casting pearls before swine, blunting my undoubted flashing wits against these Lilliputian ferrets. Most good a man is any man. He lies in his teeth. For one small hour tonight, I raised him from the gutter, whither he is now minded to return. To root and snort nostalgically. So dead, This other swarthy hound is Bill Williams, whom I tolerate because it inflates my ego to have a hound that savages everyone but me. An old soldier? You're an amazing chap, Gardner. How did you know? They never lose the smell of menopause. <laughs> Who's this blabbermouth? A friend of mine. Tell him to get lost. My saturnine fife and drum friend, you forget yourself. Whilst, if I were you, I would willingly court a similar oblivion. Nevertheless... I still am. Nevertheless, let your voice click its heels respectfully when you address yourself to me. Otherwise, I may extract the 29 tangled feet of your intestines and weave them with a pastoral horridness through the seaweedy thread of your hair. He's a boy who can do it, too. No offence, meant. The dog has come to heal. Your drink, Gardner. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, you and I, Gardner, are the only two men in this town tonight who are unafraid. You're right for us. Where's the song? Pack it in, Mac. Sing as long as you sleep. We are weaving costume by the light of the moon. We are sailing by night and by day. Well, there's one can still we sing. He is panic stricken. Utterly panic stricken. Don't you find that interesting, Barney? Not very. You'll let the bogeys in. Not at all. Gowers is all too busy, isn't he? <laughs> Out looking for a man. A kind man. Shut up. Mm -hmm. Williams is frightened too. He hides his fear as a dog hides a bone in a dark garden. Two chills of hopes. Coming down a happy valley. Here the gunner. Pull him in drunk. Pull him out dead. Spa metal in Atlantic star. He feeds like a camel on the hump of his past courage. You find all this fascinating, don't you? Fascinating? Don't you? I can take it or leave it. There was a dog howling earlier tonight. The sound infuriated me. It was a vulgar, flashy, cliché of a sound. It spoiled the fine, pure, choking, secret fear. That made each man hate his neighbour. This is a sick town. The little houses, stiff and paralysed, like rabbits awaiting the stoat. And inside, rows of benched, blenched people. Death's outpatients. I remember something like this once before. 
a small town in Florida. There was a hurricane coming. I think I'll get along the frog. Frog and toad rhyming with road. Neat, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, before you go, Williams... Well? I'd like to ask you something. See my lawyer. I smell a smell of no love lost. Did you know Francis Lennox in the army? I knew a lot of blokes. You can keep them all except Francis Lennox. Come, come, man. Enough of this virginal reticence. I knew him. Did you know him well? Well enough. What happened to him? He died. How did he die? What's it to you? How did he die, Williams? Tell me that. How did Francis Lennox die? <laughs> Somebody fell in the door. It's a girl. She's been stabbed. Lindy! Don't try to talk, dear. I must die. The doctor's on his way. Is there anything we can do? Nothing. I didn't deserve it. No, Delia. Nobody deserves this. I couldn't help it. I never had anything. All that money, clothes, and a handbag worth of forty guineas. Oh, let me die! Let me die! I can't stand this. Shut up, Foster. <laughs> Jimmy was waiting. The knife. Jimmy Morton? Yes. Jimmy Morton? Jimmy Morton? Get these people away from the door. Yes, of course. Outside, you carrion crows! Outside with your beastly indecent to your eyes! You know who else you go Can you hear me, Delia? Yes. I'm sorry about everything. <laughs> Not your fault. <laughs> Pain's nearly gone. That doctor should have been here by now. She doesn't need him anymore. Will you help me through? Mackenzie, will you get those people away from the door? Well, Gardner. Give me time, Inspector. I'll tell you all about it, but give me time. I don't have time to give you. A huge brandy, Huey. The biggest you can pour. Jimmy Morton. Jimmy Morton of all Jimmy people. Morton. Morton. Mackenzie, will you get those people away from the door and shut it? You heard what the inspector said. All of you, get away home. What did Foster mean, eh? She mentioned Jimmy Morton before she died. How did she mention him? I asked you a question, Gardner. How did she mention him? Here's the doctor, sir. Well, well, well. Another one. Who is it this time? Her name was Delia Dewar. Don't go away, Gardner. I think it's high time that you and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. So I didn't go away, but stayed there, watching it all like a grisly dream. Not quite there, not quite not there. Letting it happen to me and thinking that what was happening to me was nothing to what had happened to Delia. And then we were at the police station, and Gordon was looking tired and grey and old and sick. And everything I felt. Right, Gardner. Let's clear the ground. Let's do that. I'm not going to fight with you. And by the same token, I'm not going to allow you to fight with me. You saw that girl, didn't you? Of course I saw. Facts, Gardner. Did she mention Morton? Yes. Can you remember exactly what she said? Yes, she said Jimmy was waiting the knife. Was that the only time she mentioned him? Yes. You suggested to me not so long ago that the girl had some kind of hold over Morton. I'm sure she and had. And you told me that Jimmy Morton believed that his father was the kind man. Yes. You think Delia knew that? You think that was the hold she had? I know it was. You know? Delia was fired this morning from the Morton household. There was a row before she left. She was throwing some pretty strong accusations around. More detail, please. Well, she talked about a dagger Jimmy had brought back from Korea that was missing from the wall it hung on. Yes? And she said something about Jimmy coming home one night with, with blood on his hands. And what else? She suggested that Jimmy and his father should be asked what they knew about the kind man. And now, what have you not told me, Gardner? I've told you all that I know, and more than I wanted to. I'm not sure I believe that. This correspondence is now closed. You've suddenly become very important, Gardner. To whom? To me. 
I prefer girls. You are the only one who can stand up and say all this, now that Delia's dead. Yes, yes, I see what you mean. And it's only your word against the words of two people who will almost certainly deny everything that you've just said. I see that too. But tell me something. Well? Do you believe this kind man, Jazz? You know the theory of the maniac with a mission? Policemen never theorise. Suppose only one of the killings was meaningful, and the others were simply designed to divert attention from it. You could go even further than that. I could? You could wonder if the real murder, the meaningful one as you call it, has already been committed, or if it's still to come. I left the police station behind like a black milestone and walked along through the queasy, uneasy, seashell-whispering, thin, rheumatic rain. I couldn't go back to the house. I couldn't go back to a wire-walking, trafficking with God and Mammon and the kiss before cockcrow and the Judas round of small talk and waiting. So I kept walking until I had shed the town as a snake sheds its skin. And suddenly I was beside the sea edge, walking over ribs of hard sand. And in front of me there was something someone blacker against the black, a shaped piece of the darkness. Did I startle you? No, no. I suppose you should have done, but you didn't. In a way, I almost expected you. That's not quite accurate. Almost. What I was trying to say was that after all that's happened tonight, there seemed a kind of rightness about you being here, as though you were the spirit of the place. Black against black. To me, black is the color of kindness. I'm beginning to hate that word. The whole town hates it. it. Fills them with fear. There's going to be an explosion soon. Who are you? My name is Diana Wheeler Sprout, with a hyphen. My name is... Steve Gardner. And you're staying with the Mortons. It is a small town, isn't it? Very small. How is Jimmy? I wish I knew. Uh, tremendous talent. Tremendous. Isn't it strange how a dingy little dump like this town could produce two people like Jimmy Morton and Francis Lennox? Gold is where you find it. Did you know Francis Lennox? I was engaged to him once. Do you mind if I ask what happened? Not at all. He tried to murder me. I'd like to hear about that. Well... He's very young, very attractive, very rich, and very spoiled. And then I met Francis. Everybody says he was a very good-looking man. He was, very good-looking. What happened? We became engaged. It was a very stormy relationship right from the start, and he very soon tired of it. He was a very cruel person. Very cruel. You sometimes find that with genius. It seems to demand a constant succession of human sacrifices. Why didn't you break off the engagement? I wanted him. And I was used to getting what I wanted. Then there was the vanity thing, you know, nobody was going to walk out on me. How did he try to kill you? Brilliantly. We were at a party one night. Pretty wild one it was, too. I was very unhappy. At about four in the morning, I was quite, quite drunk. Then Francis started talking about my new car. My doting father had just bought it for me, and it was really a beast. It would have frightened a professional driver. What did he do, rig the steering? He did something much more simple and much more subtle. He bet me I couldn't drive round the low road to the next town and back in 15 minutes. I took him up. And some of my friends tried to talk me out of it, but Francis sneered that I was chicken. And that was that. It's a pig of a road, even when you're sober. And I was higher than a kite. I was hitting 90 when the farm lorry suddenly appeared out of a lane. I went through a fence and hurtled down 30 feet. The car was burnt out. I would have gone with it, but the lorry driver dragged me clear. That's why I roam about at night. Plastic surgery has its limitations. 
The more I hear of Lennox, the less I like him. You can't judge him by ordinary standards. He, he was a great poet. Does that justify everything? I don't know. Sometimes I feel very bitterly that it doesn't. And then I read the things he wrote. Do you know his work? Only one fragment. Which one? You who are alive, who survive, whom the mathematics of luck wakes ten-fingered, count of Private Dawn's blessing. What can you know of the clay and the candle of darkness and the worm's molecular kiss? I think you're mistaken. Am I? I know everything that Francis ever wrote. I even have some personal poems that have never been published, but I don't remember that one. And yet... Yes? And yet it's so exactly his style. I think I'm very glad I met you tonight. Thank you. I must go now. It'll soon be dawn. She walked away, across the hard, ribbed sand, fleeing the dawn and the seeing, searing world. I went back to the ugly town that was waking reluctantly to the frank, silver sneer of daylight. The streets were filling up with people whose faces had a morning color of bad money. A man spat on the pavement and the whole universe. At the corner of the road where the Morton house was, the policeman watched the dawn as though he thought it was loitering with intent. Morning, sir. Morning. Constable Mackenzie, isn't it? That's right, sir. You're early abroad. I could say the same about you, sir. Are you asking me where I've been? Not at all, sir. You haven't been told to keep an eye on me or anything dramatic like that, have you? No, sir. Have you been up all night? Yes. Join the club. Did you find it? I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. Your uniform's covered with ash. You've been searching through dustbins, right? Did you find it? No, sir. Not yet. You think you will? If it's there to be found. Good luck. It was full light now and rain, brushing the town lightly. Perfect weather for searching dustbins. Perfect weather for grey neurosis. Perfect weather for cutting your throat. There were lights on in the Morton household as I let myself in. Is that you, Steve? What's left of me? You like some coffee? You're a doll. In the kitchen. Hey, you've been busy. The lace was filthy. You want black or white? Uh, white, please. When the Mortons come down, they'll think they're in the wrong house. How much sugar? Two, please. I cleaned out Delia's room for myself. It nearly made me throw up. I can imagine. Here's your coffee. Thank you very much. Actually, you know, it could be a swinging room. It's a marvellous view from the window. You can look down on the whole town. I can and do. I think I'll ask Mr Morton if I can do it up. I have an idea for a colour scheme that Don't might... start planning too far ahead, Lindy. Why not? What time did you get to bed last night? Oh, I don't know. About half past eleven, I reckon. Why? Did you read for a while or anything like that? You're joking. I just finished cleaning out this muck heap of a kitchen. I was beat to the floor. So you went to sleep at once? I look a light. How do you sleep? Alone. I mean, are you a light sleeper? I sleep through earthquakes. So if anyone left the house or came into the house, you wouldn't hear them? Oh, I wouldn't. Jimmy and his father, were they in when you went to bed? I don't know. I, I had this job to do, the, the kitchen, and when I work out, well, I concentrate. So they could have been uh, nipping in and out all night without you being any the wiser? Unless they'd come into the kitchen. Which they didn't. Which they didn't. So what, Steve? Delia was murdered last night. The, the kind man? That's the way it looks. She was no great loss, was she? She's dead just the same. Oh, we're all going to do it one day. I, what's so special about it? It doesn't change what she was when she wasn't dead, you know. You're a hard-hearted generation. 
Oh, what do you want me to do? Wear black? Maybe you're right. Are the Mortons involved in this? They could be. You picked the nicest employers for me. You want to be a writer, so maybe this is something you could write about. Mm -hmm, there is that. Well, no, I'll never be able to give Delia back her photograph. Photograph? Mm, I've got it here. She'd hidden it under the paper lining in one of the drawers in my... in her room. But... But this is incredible. It's a picture of Francis Lennox, isn't it? It is. I recognised him from his picture in the library book, you know, the, the Rupert Brooke bit. But, but the woman with him? She's the woman in that portrait in the drawing room. Whoever she is, I mean, nobody introduced us. She's Jimmy's mother. The one with the shrine upstairs. Yes, but this picture's impossible. It's there. Look, Jimmy's mother died when he was born. And Jimmy told me he and Lennox were born within two years of each other. Oh, man, that photograph's about 24 or 25, wouldn't you reckon? Give or take a year, yes. Oh, so he can't be Francis Lennox. Yet he is. That's weird. Oh, good morning, Mr. Martin. Good morning, Miss Marshall. Morning, Mr. Gardner. Morning. Ah, what's that you got there, Lindy? A photograph. Oh, may I see it? Thank you. Where did... Where did you find this? Delia had it hidden away in a drawer. Delia? It's rather an odd photograph, isn't it? Odd? In what way? Well, that's your wife in that photograph, isn't it? Ye yes, it is. With Francis Lennox? No. With me. You? Myself, when young. I was quite a handsome young man. You're saying then that Francis Lennox and Jimmy were... were half-brothers. Francis, you understand... How can I put it? Well, you could see it was a... Yes, uh, you could. <clears throat> there are good reasons why Jimmy shouldn't know this. I prefer not to go into them at the moment. I'd rather not know anyway. Quite. Quite. I'd be grateful if both you and Lindy would forget about this photograph. Indeed, this whole incident... And off he goes with his broken heart to the sealed room. How about that? Oh, he was lying, that's what. You're right, he was lying. Steve, what's going on in this spooky ruin of a house? Jimmy's father did not reappear, and Jimmy didn't appear at all. So after a bored interval, I went back into the town. It was raining steadily now, but not enough to damp the strange, feverish atmosphere of violence lightly checked. I was aware that I was drawing more than my share of dirty looks. I tried not to let them worry me. It wasn't my fault that I came from the leper colony. On an impulse, I walked into the police station and asked to see Inspector Gordon. Oh, Gardner, have you come to hear my apology? Have you one to offer? Yes. I was a bit rough on you last night. I healed quickly. Right. Then what's in your mind? Have you decided that it was really the butler who did it all the time? I've decided I don't like the feeling that's building up in this town. It'll blow itself out. Will it? It did before. Nobody mentioned names before. What do you suggest? Well, couldn't you take the Mortons into protective custody? Oh, I'm afraid that's not on. Come in. Yes, what is it? Mr. Dunsmuir, the bank manager, sir. I'll ask him to wait a second. Yes, sir. Well, there's glory for you, keeping a bank manager waiting. Uh, glory indeed. Well, I suppose I better... No, 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 don't go. Gardner, I have the feeling that you have the feeling that I've just been sitting around and letting things happen. I didn't say... You that. didn't have to. So? So I want you to stay and hear what the bank manager has to say. I thought they were programmed only to say no. Constable? Yes, sir? Let's have Mr. Dunsmuir in now. Will you come in now, Mr. Dunsmuir? Thank you, Constable. Good morning, Inspector. Good morning, Mr. Dunsmuir. Filthy morning. Filthy. It is indeed. 
Uh, this is Mr. Gardner, a colleague from London. Uh, how are you? How do you do? No doubt you will be studying the differences in procedure between the legal systems of England and Scotland. Oh, just so, just so. You see, Gardner, I asked Mr. Dunsmuir to provide me with some details of the bank accounts of two people we are interested in. I see. But before he could or would comply with my request, I had to obtain and produce a warrant from the sheriff to prove that my request was in the public interest. A commendable precaution. Uh, yes, Mr. Gardner. <laughs> An Englishman's home may be his castle, uh, but a Scotsman's bank account is equally sacred. <laughs> Neatly put. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, Inspector, to business. Uh, first, uh, Jimmy Morton's account. Uh, there have been no actual deposits for about four years, but he's still very sound, very sound. What about withdrawals? There are one or two things there. About two and a half years ago, there was a withdrawal of £250. I remember mm. it. A young Mr. Morton took it out in cash. Two fifty, eh? Uh, yes, but there was something before that. Six years ago, young Mr. Morton instructed us to pay monthly £20 to a... A Miss Louisa Matthews, who lives in the neighbouring town. I've... Uh, noted down her address. Thank you. Oh, well, cherchez la femme. Uh, perhaps, Mr. Uh, Gardner, perhaps. Uh, now, what else is there? Oh, yes. Uh, just over three years ago, there began a series of withdrawals, irregular and um, almost capricious. The sums involved varied from five pounds to twenty-five. Uh, the money was always collected by Mr. Morton personally. I've uh, made out a detailed list. You? Interesting. Very interesting. Now, about Mr. Martin's senior's account. I'm afraid that has always been subject to uh, unpredictable withdrawals. He's something of a bibliophile. So I've heard. Yes. Some of the books he bought were very expensive, and when he was going to a book sale, he used to draw out uh, quite large sums in cash. Uh, I ventured to remonstrate with him once, but he said that cash transactions were simpler all the way round. Yeah. And this is a list of his various withdrawals. Uh, yes. Mm. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Dunsmuir. Your help has been invaluable. Oh. Well, uh, delighted to be of assistance, Inspector. And uh, between ourselves, rather thrilled. Oh? You know, I've been 40 years in banking, and this is the first time I've seen a sheriff's warrant. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, good morning. Good, good morning, morning, Mr. Dantier. Thank you. Well, there you are, Gardner. £20 a month to Miss Louisa Matthews. That seems clear enough. What about the 250 That isn't quite so clear. And the... Uh, what was it the man called them? The irregular and almost capricious payments? Delia, obviously. Inspector! What the devil's the matter with you, Mackenzie? We've found it, sir. We've oh. found the knife. I'll be right with you. Congratulations on opening a shut case. No, Gardner. With a little luck. Just shut. I left Gordon transformed into a series of official reflexes. Outside, the streets were animals. Growling, snarling, spitting, scratching, sharpening claws, bristling, practicing a dull roar. The news was getting round the wrong people. The whole town was, not so quietly, going mad. I hurried back to the Mortons. I hurried as though the devil was at my heels, and if he wasn't, I knew he was limbering up for it. I dashed into the house and Lindy looked up, startled. Where's Jimmy? What's wrong, Steve? Just tell me where Jimmy is. Uh, he's in the drawing room. Hello, Steve. Look at this room. That girl, Lindy's a wonder. We should have got rid of Delia long ago. Don't go around saying that. Why not? Somebody killed Delia last night. I don't believe it. I was there when she died, Jimmy. Where were you? What are you saying? She mentioned your name also about the knife. The police are coming here. They know what she said. And they found the knife. Everybody in the town knows Jimmy. And they're feeling nasty, very nasty. I've got nothing to say. It's not going to be as easy as that. There's one question you're going to have to answer. Just one? Are you the kind man? And what am I supposed to say to that? A simple yes or no. Are you the kind man, Jimmy? Steve? What is it, Lindy? At the door. Two policemen. 
The policemen at the door were all blue surge in discomfort. They had come from somewhere in a hurry, and their faces were red and moist. Hello, Mackenzie. Inspector Gordon sent us here. And this is? Constable Robertson, sir. I should have thought the inspector would have wanted to make the arrest himself. Not a question of arrest, sir. Yet. No? There's trouble in the town. They've had about, you know. Yes, I know. It started with a lot of hot-headed talk. Then it turned nasty. The inspector tried to reason with them, but... You can't reason with a mob. They're on their way now. I'd advise you to get out, sir. they tear me apart. Oh, you're a stranger. In their minds, I'm part of this household. Guilt by association. What's happening? We're all going to be lynched. Maybe if we could get the young lady out of the house. Why? Because there's a mob coming up from the town to tear it apart. This Delia business. They've got it into their heads that Jimmy did it. Did I hear my name mentioned? You're in trouble, Jimmy. Huh. You mean you've only just found out? This is different. Listen. The vigilantes are coming. For you. Maybe I'd better go and meet them. No, sir. We couldn't allow that. Might be the simplest thing all the way around. It might, sir. But Constable Robertson and I were sent here to cope. It's our responsibility till Inspector Gordon sorts it all out. I hope he gives us a decent burial. If we could only get the young lady oh, it's out. It's too late now. This crowd. There's a huge crowd coming up the hill. Bar the door, Robertson. Will someone explain? That crowd you saw is on its way here. To this house? Yes, Mr. Morton, and it's out for blood. But surely the police... There's only two of us, sir. We've sent out a call for help to the towns around, but it might be some time before it arrives. Incredible. What have we done to them? They've decided that Jimmy is the kind man. Jimmy? But that's... Ah. Delia. Yes, of course, she's the cause of all this. Yes, she is. Yeah, I should have known she would be vindictive. When this nonsense is all over, I shall lodge a complaint about Delia with the police. You're not a far to look for her. She's in our mortuary. Delia's dead. Last night, sir? Yes. Yes, of course. She had to die, hadn't she? Stand back from the windows. Well, they don't believe in ringing doorbells, do they? Go out and talk to them, Constable. They tremble him to death as soon as he opened the door. Hey, come on, Morton! Break on that door! door. Hey, break it down! I'm coming and get you! It looks as if they're fixing up some sort of battering ram. The door won't take much of that. We'd better all get upstairs. Then they'll have to come at us up that narrow staircase. They'll get themselves jammed and we might be able to stand them off till Inspector Gordon gets here. I wish I had your touching faith in Inspector Gordon. Well, the man's talking sense all the same. I don't think so. It swamp us in no time. Look, we've no time to argue. There's always time to argue. With a mob? Even with a mob. We'd better get upstairs quick, sir. I'm going to talk to them. But Jimmy, you... I'm going to talk to them. You must be out of your mind. So everybody keeps suggesting. You'd be torn to pieces, sir. That's a chance I have to take. Oh, no, you won't. You'll get upstairs if I have to knock you cold and carry you. Don't try it, Steve. No, Steve, don't. Where did you get that shotgun, Lindy? I remembered seeing it in a cupboard yesterday when I was cleaning. Put it down, miss. No, it's loaded, both barrels, and I know how to use it. But Jimmy's right, they've got to be faced out. Well, what other chance do we have? Exactly. There we go with that battering ram. Look, it's only me they're after, and if this thing doesn't work, then it's only me they'll get. I don't want anything to happen to anyone else on my account. Inspector Gordon. To Never. hell with Inspector Gordon. All right, Jimmy. Whatever you say. Fine. Let's open the door, then. All right, sir. Now! There he is! Get him! Get him! Oh. There's one shot left, and anybody can have it. Right, then. Go ahead, Jimmy. Well, my friends, you owe my father a new door. All you had to do was ring the bell, you know. Granted, we're not the most sociable family in the town, but we still answer the doorbell. Well, you're all here, aren't you? And I'm not going to pretend I'm delighted to see you. I'm not. But in a repulsive kind of way, I'm glad you came. I think we have things to discuss. And since I don't appear to have a great deal of future... Well, all that means is there's no time like the present. Will you get a present? Let the man speak. I think he's got them, sir. It could still go either way. I'd like to tell you a story. A piece of self-indulgence on my part. It's a long time since I was a stand-up comic, and maybe I've forgotten how to do it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. A lot of you here already know the story. It happened right here in this town. It happened during the Depression. 
when the word affluent wasn't even in the dictionary. There was a man here who worked in the rope works, and when the rope works started laying men off, he was flung in the street. He was a simple soul. If his brain had exploded, it wouldn't have blown his hat off. <laughs> now, there he was, out of work, and having a bad time, and the story goes on that he wrote applying for the job of hangman, saying that he'd served his time at the rope works. That was how the story went, and there are men among you I've seen laughing at it time and time again. Whether the story was true or false, nobody ever quite knew. But here's the funny thing. True or false, nobody would ever speak to the man again. He was an outcast, a pariah. He got so bad that finally he packed up and left the district. You hounded him out of town because you said he wanted to be the hangman. And here you all are wanting to be just that. I can understand why, of course. I can even sympathize with you to a certain extent. Your self-respect demanded a sacrifice. And, well, I was it. Your self-respect demanded a sacrifice because the kind man had almost destroyed it. He frightened you right down to the holes in your socks. That's what brought you here today, all you big, brave people. You had to kill the kind man to show that you weren't really afraid of him and that you denied your kinship with him. So you came along, courageously, two hundred of you to kill one man. And the terrible thing is, you don't really care whether I'm the kind man or not. You literally couldn't care less. Someone has to pay for your shame. And if it's a substitute victim instead of the real one, so what? It's the killing that really counts. That's that, then. Now here's a bit of information about the kind man. I can't see who he is because I don't know. But I do know who he isn't. He isn't me. They tell me some people think he is. They tell me that even the police think so. They tell me I'm to be arrested. They tell me, they tell me, they tell me. I'm sick and tired of them telling me. So I'm going to do a bit of telling for a change, and I might as well start with you. I just want to tell you two things. Firstly, I'm innocent. Secondly, to hell with a lot of you. And now, if anyone would like to step forward to apologize, here I am. Here's Inspector Gordon at last. For heaven's sake, get Jimmy back inside. Right, sir. Mr. Morton, in all my years in the force, I've never seen anything like that. It was just magnificent. Thank you. It was wild, real wild, wasn't it, Steve? Yeah. What happens now, Mackenzie? Well, sir, I... Inspector Gordon's here, it's for him to say. I'll be in the drawing room. You go with him, Lindy. I want to have a word with the inspector. Okay. Spread out down the house, now. And make sure there aren't any stragglers. Well, Gardner, I got here just in time. You didn't. I thought... Mackenzie will tell you about it later. Any casualties? None. You don't seem exactly friendly, Gardner. Please, no, not another one that wants to be loved. Oh, you wrong me, Gardner. Where is he? In there. Right, let's get it over with. Are you charging him here? I'm not charging him at all, yet. I'd like to talk to him before you take him away. Well... Oh, come on, Inspector. I'm not going to bake a cake with a file in it. I only want to talk to the guy. You've got ten minutes. He was sitting beside the fire, huddled deep inside himself. He looked ridiculously young and lost and attractive. Lindy sat opposite watching him, and the way she was watching him, I did not like. You all right, Jimmy? I'm freezing. That's pure reaction. I'm suddenly frightened. Reaction again, you should recognize it from your Korean days. Yes, Steve, I know. 
It's time to go. The inspector's given me a few minutes. What for? I didn't confide in him. <laughs> That's not quite an answer, is it? No. The answer is... I wanted to know if you're still going through with this. Yes. It's a nonsense, of course, you know that. I don't want to discuss it, Steve. I can't say I blame you. What's that supposed to mean? It means, Jimmy, that you're a crashing bore. A self-indulgent, self-pitying, self-dramatising, impossible bore. Come on, Steve, that's a bit strong. It's all right, Lindy. Ah, uh, now we're getting the Christian bit. He's turning the other cheek. Look, Steve. You're a hypocrite, a liar and a coward. How can you say that after what happened out there just now? Shall I tell you what happened out there just now? Shall I? What you saw out there was a piece of tatty old theatre. Pure, unadulterated ham. Jimmy Morton with his first audience for years. And he was willing to let it kill him rather than miss the spotlight. Have you quite finished? No. Out there today, you were at least acting out your fantasy for 200 people. But who were you acting it out for during the past few years? What audience had you then? Yourself, Jimmy, that's who. You were acting out this lousy, stinking drama for yourself. And all the time, people were dying. You realise that? People were dying. And you could have stopped it with a few words in the right place. But that would have spoilt the game, wouldn't it? All right, then. Now we've got a new thing starting, the martyr bit. But does that guarantee that innocent people are going to stop dying, does it? Here's my father. You'd better ask him. Well, um, I, I have the feeling that the inspector's becoming rather impatient, Jimmy. I'm ready when he is. I'm coming down to the police station with you. You don't have to, Father. Well, perhaps not, but I want to. Let's go, then. Well, there they go. And they deserve each other. You really lost your cool there, didn't you, Professor? Yeah, yeah, I did. You were jealous. I was what? I could see it in your face as soon as you walked in. Get you. You were, weren't you? I didn't like to think you were impressed by that piece of grandstand rubbish. Like I say, you were jealous. From where I was standing, you looked impressed. <sighs> Do you know what I was thinking? I was watching him all in love with himself and his secret sorrow, and I, I was thinking, what do I do to make him communicate? Do I, I, I let out a wild yell or take my clothes off or what? <laughs> well, you fooled me. Do you fancy me, Steve? Strongly. Stop sending me up. Of course I fancy you. You're a bird, aren't you? And I'm the greatest bird fancier of all time. I don't fancy you. At, at least not that way. Oh, well, I won't cry. I'll just try to pick up the shattered pieces of my life. It's a shame I don't fancy you. You see, you're straight. <laughs> a thing like that gets around. It could ruin a man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, do you reckon I'm still gainfully employed here? I reckon. In that case, I'll go and make us some coffee. Do that. What now, Steve? Back to London? Not yet. Not quite yet. I still have things to do. So, in the fullness of time, I went down into the town. Now more than ever quiet and ashamed hung over with the morning's near violence, and I took a bus into the next village. The village stood high on a hill, dozing across the sea. You could have counted the houses on the fingers of one hand. One of them was disguised as an antique shop. The oldest thing it had was a curling notice. Please prevent dogs from annoying cat when sleeping in the window. The last house was the one I was looking for, the house of one Miss Louisa Matthews. I don't know what I expected. Uh, yes, I do. And so do you. But she wasn't. She was big and buxom and as normal as fresh air. She made you think of milk and flowery hands and scrubbing brushes and measles and whooping cough. She was every mother that is, was, and ever shall be. Come in, come in. Uh, thank you. The place is in a bit of a mess. You call this a mess? Well, 
Let's just see. I haven't tied it up yet. And now, Mr. Uh, Gardner, did you say? That's right, yes. Oh, sit down. Thank you. Oh, what can I do for you, Mr. Gardner? How do you react to embarrassing questions? I thrive on them. Good. Uh, try me with one. Right between the eyes? I like that kind best of all. Why does Jimmy Morton pay you £20 a month? Because he's one of the finest people I know. Which gets us exactly nowhere. <laughs> Maybe if I knew more about what this is an aid of... It's I an aid of Jimmy Morton. He's in terrible trouble. And what happens to him could depend on whether or not you've anything to tell me. If that's the case, then I'll tell you anything you want to know. I'll let the original question stand. I call myself Miss Louisa Matthews, but that's really my maiden name. And your married name? Mrs. Frances Lennox. Well, how about that? I see you've heard the name before. Oh, yes, indeed. Jimmy was one of the few people who knew. You see, Francis kept me a secret. He was a bit sensitive about me being ten years older than he was. Then he went out and got himself killed? Yes. I think somehow I expected that. It was as though something like that had to happen to Francis. He had a kind of doom on him right from the day he was born. And I think he knew it. He was a very unhappy person. A genius, they say. Oh, that's just a silly word people throw about. I should think you gave him something nobody else ever did. What would that be? Peace. Oh! <laughs> Why are men so sentimental? Well, anyway, that's beside the point. After Francis passed on, I was left very badly placed. And this is where Jimmy comes into the picture. Right. He found this little house for me, and he pays me £20 a month. I don't object, but I'm not a parasite. I take the money because... Because? <laughs> it sounds daft, but in some peculiar way, I feel I'm doing Jimmy a favour. Yes, maybe you are. Uh, tell me, did Jimmy ever pay you a lump sum of £250? No, never. Thank you for being so patient. Not at all. If it would help Jimmy, I'd answer questions all day long. I left the unexpected widow of the dead poet and caught a bedraggled bus. It wove its way through lanes and turnings, and every now and then, the conductress would open the door and throw a newspaper at a garden gate. Once she missed and smiled at me as though to say, oh, well, none of us is perfect. It was dark when we reached the kind man's town. There was light in Huey McGuinness's tavern. There was Romilly Foster, too. He was sprawling priratically against the glistening, swabbed counter. And as he might have put it, blackbearding the captives of his cutlass wit and Captain Kidding, the grey town stolid merchantman. Gardener, my metropolitan friend, come and astonish me with an intelligible sentence. What would you like to drink? A tankard of ale. A uh, scotch for me, Huey, a large one, please. Very do, Gardener. Let us, you and I, Gardener, settle ourselves in reposeful attitudes for a short, sharp session. I'm oh, sorry, I can't wait long. Ah, the 20th century motto. You are all doomed hunters pursuing the frightful coronary. One large whiskey. And one pint. There's your drink. Ah, thank you. Slang. As you say. Ah. You saw that mob today? I did. It gathering its snorting, snouting way past me as I stared down from my window in a torpor of fascinated revulsion. It gave off a dingy, muted roar like a suburban love affair. Jimmy Morton's been picked up by the police. In the circumstances, of course, it was inevitable. You think Jimmy is guilty? Doesn't matter what I think. It will be a sensational trial. How long have you known Bill Williams? Mm, uh, about uh, five years, I should say. He was your source of information about Francis Langs's death? He was. Tell me about it. Categorically, no. Why not? You're a friend of Jimmy Morton, aren't you? Well, so am I. Well, then what? 
At the moment, there is a tiny gleam of hope that Jimmy might beat this charm. You're an optimist. And let's say rather that I am not a pessimist, but I am a realist. And stories get around, despite all attempts to keep Jory's hermetically sealed. I'm not with you. If the story of how Francis Lennox died gets around, then Jimmy Morton has had it. There's a flaw there somewhere. You think so? Yes, a flaw named Bill Williams. I wouldn't believe anything that character said. You may be right, but that's hardly the point. What do you mean? I mean that the truth or otherwise of the story is incidental. True or false, it can only do harm. So it's better that it should not be divulged. I don't agree with you. Feel free to differ. Where do I find Williams? In Key Street, number 47. Beneath the icicle wing of one Mrs. Keyhole, whose smile has been known to turn blue litmus paper red. You could have said that Williams, in his grim, trim, spotless, stand-beside-your-beds kind of room, was glad to see me. What do you want? A couple of words with you. M. She. Blow before I kick you down the stairs. You might even be able to do it. I could. It'd be a waste. I'd only come back with the police. We've nothing to talk about. Oh, yes, we have. For instance, there's the £250 you got from Jimmy Morton. It was a loan. For what? I was thinking of emigrating. I was a bit short, so I went to see Jimmy. He was an old op, old man. £250 worth? He was well healed. I did him many a favour when he was in the ranks. What did you have that was worth £250? Was it something to do with Francis Lennox? Was it? A bundle of papers. I uh, found them in Lennox's kit. Let's say you robbed the dead. Say what you like. What kind of papers? Poems and things like that. Did you read them? I did. <laughs> Rubbish about candles of darkness and stuff. And Jimmy gave you £250 for them? Well, they were original manuscripts, weren't they? You'll have to do better than that, Williams. <sighs> You're right. I can do better than that. I can get away with it, you see. People like Jimmy always get away with it. What did you sell him? piece of paper with four signatures. It belonged to Lennox? No. But it concerned him. In what way? The four people that signed it executed him. Executed? Yes. Yeah. And in this paper they admitted it and explained why. Go on. Well, we were in the prison camp, see, and three of the boys tried to escape. They were caught. Next day, we were lined up and Forced to watch what happened to him. We found out later that Lennox had tipped the guards off about the escape. <laughs> and you'll never guess why. Why? To get a very special privilege. Paper for a poem he was working on. You have to be joking. Oh, sure. <laughs> Three dead men. Big joke. What happened then? Well, things started to go our way. The enemy started pulling out. And they just went off and left us. Like so much litter. Which we were. We all split up and wandered around. Lost. Starving. The party I was with consisted of seven blokes. Including Jimmy. Including Jimmy. Anyway, we, we flapped around for nearly a week. And one day, he came across another escaped prisoner. He, he was just lying there. He, he broke his ankle. Francis Lennox? Yeah. So? One of the blokes with us was a little taffy named, named Reese. His brother had been one of the ones... Well, we discussed what to do with Lennox. Three of us were for leaving him. You know, solving it that way. And Jimmy was one of the three? No. I don't believe you. 250 quid, remember? Well, that was it. We were outvoted four to three, and, and Lennox had had it. So the other four drew lots to see who'd carry out the sentence. It was Jimmy. Jimmy killed Francis Lennox? Lennox was lying there with his broken ankle. He, 
He looked up and smiled. Well, Jimmy, he said. Jimmy said nothing, no, no expression. Cool as you like. Just shot Lennox through the head. And they drew up this statement and all signed it. Right. Man, oh man. Oh, he's a weird character, is Jimmy. A very weird character indeed. Jimmy's father sat there alone, the keeper of the shrine. The room was lit by an old-fashioned oil lamp, and its plain speaking yellow light revealed that he was neither weak nor ineffectual, but strong and positive. I've been hoping you would come. I'm flattered. <laughs> You're a very dangerous young man. If stupidity is dangerous, yes. No, no. I won't accept that. You have a quick brain and a certain, yes, ruthlessness. And most dangerous of all, you don't look dangerous. Do you guess my weight as well? I was allowed to see Jimmy tonight. You did a good job there. I'm not at all sure I understand that. But I... Th did you hear anything just now? Should I have done? No. And now you say it's been like that all day, and we laugh inordinately. Uh, I beg your pardon? It's nothing, an old joke. Mm -hmm. Cards on the table, yes? Nothing would please me more. Would you care to begin? Very well. I have a feeling that you have decided that I am the kind man. Put it this way. I think you are more likely to be than Jimmy. It wasn't my name, Delia whispered as she died. I think we might even get round that. <laughs> you are a dangerous young man. Dangerous to whom? Yourself, perhaps. Shall I go on? By all means. It all hangs together, doesn't it? Even to the stage props, this old crumbling house, the shadows and the creakings. I'm sorry you haven't been comfortable here. I haven't been. Not in any sense. Tell me why. The night I arrived here, we had a rather odd conversation. You told me Jimmy's mother died giving birth to him. Yes. I got the ridiculous impression that night that you'd never quite forgiven Jimmy for being born. There's nothing ridiculous about that. You then told me about this sealed off part of the house, this shrine to your wife, this empty sepulcher that remained exactly as she'd left it, this this grave where the piano was always kept tuned. I'm sorry. You told me you were in the habit of sitting up here alone for hours. I really am sorry, but I'm certain there's someone in the house. It's probably Lindy moving about. No. What makes you so certain? Because I sent Lindy away. So we're alone in the house. Or should be. Cozy. <laughs> Probably my imagination. As you say, the house is crumbling. Where were we? We were in this hermetically sealed room. The room with a backward view. No one to talk with but a ghost. The ghost of the woman you gradually convinced yourself had been murdered. And your son was her murderer. Simply by being born, he had become that. Fascinating. Then you discovered he actually was a murderer. You're talking now about Francis Lennox. Yes, Jimmy's half-brother and your son. You're beginning to make it all sound horribly persuasive. Lennox was older than Jimmy, wasn't he? Two years. Your first born, as they say. Wrong side of the blanket, but nevertheless. No, I admit I preferred him to Jimmy. I should think that's an understatement. I still don't see the kind man in this. Well, here's how I see him. You decided that Jimmy was a murderer twice over, and he had killed the two most important people in your life, so he had to be punished, put away for good. So the kind man was invented? Yes. I don't quite see the necessity. Oh, yes, you do. You had to create a figure of horror and loathing, the kind of figure that could provoke that hysterical lynching reaction you saw this afternoon. You're not seriously suggesting that that was my doing this afternoon? Not directly. What I am suggesting is that you set up the conditions that created it. You astonish me. Are you still hearing things? I keep thinking I do. Oh, it's all in your head. What a terrifying head you seem to think I have. Oh, I do. How did you manage the business with the poems? 
Oh, that was uh, simple. A handy ventilator shaft? Very handy. It sent Jimmy out wandering at night because he didn't dare go to bed. And when he wandered, so did you, with a knife Jimmy had brought back from Korea. You make me sound quite fiendishly ingenious. Oh, you were, you were. But you rather slipped up about the poems. An ex-girlfriend of Lennox's knew every published poem that he wrote, but not that one, not The Candle of Darkness. Are you adding plagiarism to my crimes? No. The poem was one of a bundle Bill Williams handed over to Jimmy. So? Unpublished poems. That's what it came from. As if you didn't know. Frankly, I didn't. You're a pretty cool character. Why shouldn't I be? None of this is susceptible of the slightest proof. If I may borrow your own phrase, it's... It's all in your head. Jimmy didn't think so. I'm afraid I can't accept any responsibility for what my son thinks. You haven't fitted Delia into your reconstruction yet. She fits. She was greedy. She was not very bright. She was. Both of those things. My guess is that she noticed that the knife had gone from the wall. She saw the nocturnal procession from this house. You would go out and Jimmy would follow you. You know, I never noticed him once. I think that one night he came across one of the victims. That was the night she saw him with blood on his hands. The night they both decided that I was a homicidal maniac. Which you weren't. You're quite right. I wasn't. Jimmy paying Delia to keep quiet to protect the man who was trying to destroy him. Crazy. Very ironical. I can't understand why I had to kill her. Because she brought the trail back to this house and Jimmy. It could easily have been proved that she was blackmailing him, and from there on, everything was fine. Poor, stupid Delia. She had the knife, of course. Yes, she had. And Jimmy went to meet her to buy it back. That was his intention. But you met her first and got it cheaper. All it cost was her life. Funny, isn't it? What is? The way you never see people. Sometimes the way one does see them is even funnier. So you killed Delia, dumped the knife where it would be found, and that was that. She probably never even saw you. She probably thought it was Jimmy all the time. I think this has gone far enough. All right, so you've got a gun. Guns don't frighten you. They frighten me. Gardner, I want you to listen. I'm listening. You still can't hear anything. We've been through this routine before. I have the most extraordinarily acute hearing, and I tell you, someone came into this house very shortly after you did. Let's hope it's the police. It isn't. You know who it is? Yes. It's the kind man. What did you say? I'm afraid I misled you the other day. I am not Francis Lennox's father. He is the man who's on his way upstairs now. But I want you to stand over there behind the curtains. I don't... Please, he's almost here. All right, then. You're quite a clever young man. You got everything almost right, except for one minor detail. You got the wrong murderer. I am a clever young man. Hurry, please, he's almost here. Good evening, Romilly Foster. <laughs> so this is the famous room, is it? This is her room. It reeks nauseatingly of hand-painted china, dyed glass and vases, and Chopin waltzes arranged for the beginner. I'm glad you like it. Who visits you here? Mary Rose? Being allowed here is a privilege. Are you alone in the house? <laughs> What makes you think I'm not? I thought I heard voices. You probably heard me. You talk to the dead? I talk to myself. <laughs> I just tantamount them out to the same thing. You may be right. Now, Morton, tell me why you sent for me. To kill you. <laughs> I'm going to kill you because you're not fit to live. That remark, Morton, infers a monstrous arrogance. You have no exclusive right to arrogance. Any more than your son had. You know, then? I know. And I have a gun. That, of course, puts everything in quite a different light. Oh, I'm glad you agree. Obviously, one or other of us must die now. Uh, my feeling is that you should go first. 
I always have preceded you, haven't I? That... That is a characteristic sneer at a dead woman. I wonder which one of us she thought about when she was dying. I know what you're trying to do, Foster. But I have gone beyond jealousy. You're wrong, Morton. If ever jealousy crooked a trigger finger, it is here and now. How did you find out? Delia was careless. In what way? She left behind a photograph of you and my wife. She must have stolen it from my room. She was only a traitor by accident, which is more than can be said for your son, Francis Lennox. My son was the greatest creative mind of the century. He betrayed his comrades. And for what? For paper and pencil to write his dreary poems. They were great poems, great poems. Worth the lives of three men. Why not? Who were they anyway? Tom, Dick and Harry, non-entities. Men with no faces who dragged themselves up anonymously and lived lives as sterile as steel. They were human beings. The world's verminous with human beings. Every tick of the clock brings thousands of them, high shilling into the world. Most of them scuttle across history like water beetles that never even pinprick the surface of the water. They eat and sleep and procreate and die in a dark, empty nothingness. But occasionally, one in every million million is something different. A Shakespeare, a Mozart, a Michelangelo, a Francis Lennox. You see, that's the real point. That's the heart of the matter. Your son and his barbarian accomplices were patriots, but patriotism is only for the tribe. What my son did was a sin against the tribe, but what your son and the others did to Francis Lennox was a sin against mankind. I'm still going to kill you. Well, then, do it instead of talking about it. I would have killed you ten times over by now, just as I would have killed your murderous son. I nearly did do it, just as he did it to Francis. Delia and I nearly managed it. We were a good team. Did you know that I came in and out of this house as I pleased, at all hours of the day and night? And I knew when you and your neurotic son were taking your midnight promenades, Delia and I had a signal, a light in the window, as simple as that. Then I would slip out with the dagger she stole for me. <laughs> the, the first one was my own Charlie Day. You should have seen the surprise in her face. She lay in the gutter like a heap of dirty washing. The boy I killed was a great admirer of mine. I used to lend him books. The tramp. He just happened to be there. And Delia? Delia. I was sorry about Delia. I liked her. She stole the poems for me. Sorry about her. But the opportunity was too good. She was meeting Jimmy. She was going to, uh, to sell him back the knife. She didn't have the knife. She was going to pretend to get it, collect in advance. I knew where she was waiting, slipped out of the pub. Is that you, Jimmy, she said. I whispered, yes, and she never really knew it was Jimmy or it wasn't. And I stood in the pub as she died and shouted Jimmy's name all over the place. Later, I dumped the knife in the dustbin. <laughs> Imagine Jimmy thinking you were the kind man. You who've never been any kind of man. Do you know what your wife once said to me? The first time she left you. Foster. Shall I tell you what she said? Shall I? She said... You can come out now, Gardner. He's dead. Excellent. You didn't have to kill him. He was a dangerous maniac. You still didn't have to kill him. He was attacking me. No, no. No, he wasn't. He was attacking me, and I defended myself. That's not the way I saw it. You were behind a curtain. That's what the story's going to be, is it? My word against yours, if necessary. But, man, you shot him down. You just shot him down. He was mad. And what are you? I am quite coldly sane. Yes. Yes, I believe you are. 
And now the uh, police, perhaps? Or shall I help you bury him in the garden? I don't like sick jokes, gardener. I'm not hooked on them myself. And tonight is the sickest joke I've come across in a long time. A man came here who had killed four people. He tried to attack me, and I was forced to defend myself. And you just happened to have a gun. Which I have had in the same place for years. And the rest of the story? It can all go in. As long as it ends up with him attacking and you defending. Yes. Big swinging lie. No, Gardner. The simplest thing. All the way round. So I went to the police station and gave them the revised version. And they took off. Like something in an old movie. Come back in the morning, they said. You're tired or something. And there's a body to collect. So come back in the morning and tell us all about it. You should live so long. So I decided to stay in some local hotel, which gave me a choice of one. And being without luggage, I paid cash in advance and started getting quietly sloshed. And there were voices sounding in my head. Like Joan of Arc, I was hearing voices. What can you know of the clay and the candle of darkness and the worm's molecular kiss? Then the voices were gone, and I got up and went out into the clear, hard night, and was surprised to find that there were stars and salt in the sea wind. And it was not even particularly late, and the kind man would never walk the streets again. So I went down to the sad Italian sad cafe, and it was still open. And she was there, alone at a table, reading a paperback. The prettiest girl that e'er I saw was sucking paperbacks through a straw. You've been drinking. As they say up here, I have been having a refreshment. I don't like alcohol. I know, your father was a lush. Have another, whatever it is. No, thank you. Some coffee and biscuits, then. Steve Gardner, the last of the big spenders. That's me. Why do you drink, Steve? To forget. Don't talk soft. Oh, well, there are a few of us left. The chaps with the stiff upper lips. The chaps that don't talk about women in the mess. The chaps that will lie to protect a lady's honour. You're not making sense. I am to myself. Well, share it. Why not? You found the photograph after all. You mean that one of Mr. Morton and his wife? I mean that one of Romilly Foster and Mr. Morton's wife. You're joking. I was present at the confrontation. The old eternal triangle. Jealousy and bitterness. You name it, they had it. Mr. Morton lied to us. Half lied. Jimmy Morton and Francis Lennox were brothers, all right, but different fathers. You dig? That's what you meant about protecting a lady's honor. That was why he lied. That's why. It doesn't sound like it stayed protected. Oh, it didn't. I've got to get out of this rotten little town. What's this? Come to London with me, Lindy. Oh, no, now, wait a minute. I'm serious. You want to come to London, don't you? Well, I, I reckon that one day I would have to... We can leave tomorrow. I'd have to know what I'm letting myself in for. No strings. You don't fancy me, remember? I remember. I was wondering if you did. You'll come, then? Yes. I'll fix you up with something when we get there. Oh, great. Why the big rush? Because I want to get away from this evil place. And I don't want anybody I like staying behind. Evil? It's a bit strong, isn't it? A dreary, yes, but evil. I saw a cold-blooded murder tonight. Steve. Straight up. What's the thing to do when you've seen a cold-blooded murder? Go to the police. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. I'll pick you up in the morning, here, about ten. So I went to the place with the blue lamp and asked to see Inspector Gordon. And I was passed on so fast 
you might have thought I was infectious. And Gordon looked at me as though indeed I was just that. I've been looking for you. I haven't been hiding. I thought you'd have gone back to the Morton house. No. Why not? Reasons. I spend my life listening to reasons. As often as not, they turn out to be excuses. I've never trusted you, Gardner. And I think you enjoy putting people at a disadvantage, even when it's unnecessary. Which story are you going to tell me? The true one. I warn you, I know it. Then you can apologize to me when I've finished. Wilfred Morton specifically asked that you tell the truth. He said that? He left a note. A note? He committed suicide just before we got there. So that was finally how I got to tell the truth. And when I finished, they wrote it all down, as much as I knew. Which was not everything, and there are still things I don't know and never will. Loose ends. The world is made of them. And anything too tidy is a lie. Next morning I collected Lindy and took her to the station. Then I went back to the Morton house to pick up various bits and pieces. Jimmy was there, looking as he always did, as he always would. Well, Steve? Just dashed in to collect some things. You're going then? Back to London with Lindy. Lucky man. You're wrong. It's not like that at all. Oh, well, you can't win them all. I'm sorry about your father, Jimmy. Are you? Yes. Perhaps it was all for the best. Uh, you can set up the London thing, Steve. Yes, I'm sorry my father's dead. You can set up the London thing. How about that? I thought you would have been pleased. All right, Jimmy, I'll set up the London thing. What's wrong, Steve? I don't know. I thought you were one thing, but you turned out to be something quite different. I don't know. Maybe I feel a little foolish and naive. Maybe I'm squeamish, not digging people who shoot other people through the head and think nothing of it. Could be I worry unduly about the kind of person who thinks he knows who's butchering person after person and says nothing. I don't know. Steve, you don't understand. I thought it was my father. No, Jimmy. You just didn't care. You never did care. Unless you can make some gesture, like the money for the widow of the man you shot. Oh, now look, Steve. Lindy once said you were soft at the center. She was wrong. You're just hollow. You should be sorry for me. Maybe I should be, but I'm not. Probably see you around London. Probably. Bye, Steve. Goodbye. Come on, come on, you'll miss the train. Uh, Porter, take the bags. Uh, How can I never order porters around like that? Here you are, madam. Did you get that? Wow. First class and everything. That's not the way a madam reacts. Tip the man. That's just what I'm doing. Thank you, sir. I, I hope you enjoyed your stay. It was hilarious. And look what he's taking back with him. Ah, it's not a bad wee town at all. Quiet, you know, nothing ever happens. But not a bad wee town.